hold the front page, the Chadwick Fiddleyard is complete and it's got a massive reverse loop. Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway, I'm Charlie and in this video I hope to go from a total mess to multiple trains running but we have to keep our fingers crossed. Now it's actually Monday morning and I'll shoot this video over the next three days and it's a quarter to ten. With these videos I shoot a bit, edit a bit, shoot a bit, edit a bit the way I go on. That way if I get a clip say where a battery fails I don't have to go, you know, I won't have a missing segment. So whilst it might seem that the time tr tends to drag a little bit it's because I'm editing as I go. Not that you'll notice that in the video, hopefully. Right, okay, so where did we leave off? Well, we left off here on board nine. Board nine is the really the end of the fiddle yard and has various points underneath. It was all a bit of a complex board to get in, but at last it's in. As you'd expect, moving on from board nine, here we have board 10. Now board 10 only has five points on it, but I can only fit four at the moment because we need to line board 10 up with H2, the second helix, all exciting stuff. So we need to get these boards into position, figure out exactly where the track's going to go and how they'll fit in with the helix. But here is the base of the helix. Now this is 59 inches across. Um, it's a big old beast and as you can see in the centre I've got a couple of extra legs and that's because I wanted to give it more support in the middle because I have a habit of climbing inside my helix in case there's a problem. Admittedly with the first helix it's against the wall so access is somewhat limited whereas on this one it should be much easier. Now switching back to the track plan and this is with any rail Hopefully you can see here that this is board 9 in this area, goes through onto board 10 and then um, board, we're now board 11, we, I'll call it helix 2 or H2 and that's where we're going to build the second helix. And if you want me to film the building of the second helix or in fact you don't, then please leave a comment down below so I'll know exactly um, what you'd prefer. There we go. Right, so I need to now fit board 10 and the massive helix board. Now the first thing I need to do is struggle with board 9 and pop this one into place which shouldn't be too much of a struggle. Doesn't do your back any good does it? That should pop in to there and then bolt it together. And then of course there is the monster board of which I will need my wife's help. That won't be filmed that bit I'm afraid. <laughs> she wouldn't like that. Now staying with board 10 for a moment, I bolted it to board 9 and these are the tracks that um, I've already sort of cut and they just drop into place so I know where they're going to go. That point is fixed. I've got two lines to bring down here. Um, that one there, this one here goes into this point and this one back up here into there and then I've got another line to come along to another point and this is the problem area because I can't put this point in until um, I figure out exactly where the helix board lines will go in so let's bring in the monster. Well now the board is in position I think you can appreciate the size of it and it really is a monster as I said it's 59 inches uh, sort of square with the corners knocked off and um, the great plan with this is to have a reverse loop around the outside of the helix so the first thing I need to do now is map out where the helix is going to go and then draw where the reverse loop is going to go and then I can work backwards um, to board 9 to find out where that last point's going to go and then I can whip that board back off, fit that point, point, mode, point and point motor and the rest of those tracks and then get onto this one and to see um, exactly how we're going to plan it out. I shouldn't really be talking in inches, it's just under um, one and a half metres um, across which uh, it's actually one, it's uh, 100, 140 centimetres is the size of it. 
and of course here now we become quite limited in the space to come through but you can see the size of this peninsula um, that I'm trying to build and obviously the track here will come up up the top of the helix up here and then lead right back in so it will be a rather large u-shaped development by the time it's all finished exciting times what I omitted to mention was this board was actually made for me as a bespoke build from DCC train automation and James down there we had a sort of a close um, liaison exactly what I wanted because I only needed these curves to transit in and out of this area of the layout so um, this is what I decided on and uh, and my thanks again as usual go to Lee Stoddart who's the brains behind the track plan um, so the board made by uh, James and also the helix itself now the helix I've got into place and popped a nail in the middle of the board um, and what I shall do is draw the lines around marking out where the helix will be and then I can then work out how much of a gap I need for my track around the outside it's worth mentioning at this stage that the helix is made out of um, M8 uh, bars a threaded bar and it comes up through here with all the supporting system um, but of course you can't put the bar on the joins because there are main timbers underneath so it will all be slightly to one side as it were but again all I need to do now is draw um, the helix plan and then I can I can come back to the helix at a later stage I just need to get these uh, these tracks uh, down and sorted Now I've turned the brightness down in the camera so hopefully you can see where the lines of the helix boards will go. Obviously we won't stay at this level because they'll st slowly start to rise up here and then around as it works its way up. And I've popped in a few pieces of track just to keep me straight and all I've got is a nail in the middle, a pencil of the right distance and all I'm going to do is scribe a line around the outside um, of the board this is where I perceive that my track or well, the centre of my track ought to be and it's this piece here it's actually quite straightforward and it's when we come into joining up with board 10 that we can become more of a free spirit and then just go where the lines want to take us. The most difficult piece of course is this piece here where the two lines come onto the helix, well one comes on and one comes off um, and that will take uh, a little bit more planning let's say. Right. That makes perfect sense let's see if we can draw these up together now using the track plan we've got a bit of track in place and looking over to the far side we've got the missing point and I think it needs to go just about there and it's a a, a pico curved left hand point and it breaks that track into two and the inside track then becomes the outside track of the helix obviously racing around the outside goes our reverse loop coming back up to the other end and joins up with this point that's already in obviously the other side of the point goes to the down line of the helix and there the pair of helix lines are going off it's always worth remembering that model trains don't like s curves especially if they're tight so i try to keep the s curves down to a minimum there is one around the bottom here slight one and obviously there's one at the top end there um, and coming off the the inside of the helix coming through there there's a little bit of an s-curve if I zoom in to there so apart from that things are looking pretty good so now I can turn my uh, attention back onto board 10 and get that missing point uh, put in and so I'll flip this board back onto its side fit that point motor um, and then put it back up. 
Now I'm sure it hasn't escaped your attention that with the reverse loop you have a polarity issue and to that end I've purchased from Digitrax a, wait for it, a BXPA1 Loconet DCC occupancy detector with transponding and auto reversal power management. That's a gobful in it. Anyway, so this little gizmo here should carry out the um, auto reversing for me and because I'm into block detection and train control and all that blah, um, it should sort out those issues there. It's got two Loconet feeds on the back end. I need to give it an address and there's a couple of pots here for tweaking it and all the rest of it. But hopefully this should sort that one out. And I've also got another one because I've got another reverse loop to go above it. So this area here is earmarked for all these Digitrax components. Um, but uh, just in case you're wondering, um, this is what I'm using. I'm not going to recommend it because we haven't tried it yet, but we'll see how we get on. But it is solid state rather than having some clicky relay that can jam up. Next thing then, get this point in, wired, all sorted out and uh, we'll progress from there. So now I've got to break this all away, take this board out, tip it on its side, do me drilling, wire all that up and I'll be back shortly. And just for the record, it's nearly two o'clock. Now it might be worth mentioning that I've changed the way I wire my points. So after the normal modification of snipping out the two bridge wires there and obviously soldering on a frog cable, um, I've removed the, the point wire because I'm using slow action um, point motors and then I bring in four cables, two reds and two blacks. And the cable size are 1602 and 702. So the power's coming in on, six, on the 1602, but it also goes back out on the 702 to the point motor. So rather than bringing in extra cables, I just bring one in and one out, and it sort of simplifies what I'm doing. Anyway, I've drilled the two holes, and all I need to do, hopefully, sorry, the three holes, and hopefully I just need to pop these in, and we should be away. Now, I've said this before, but it might be worth another mention that in the fiddly yard area, I secure my track work down using these Pico screws. Um, if you make a mistake, it's, you just unscrew it and move it around to where you want it, really. So there's no taking out of nails or scraping off uh, glues. So just a case of popping it in position. And then all I do is I drill a small hole in the front sleepers. And then one in one side of the rear sleepers. Check that the point hole is lined up centrally, which it is, and then pop a screw in there. Nothing could be much easier really, could it? And then one on the back end. And there's no banging around and hitting the track with hammers and we've all done it. Um, it just makes it a, a bit more simpler really, easy. Now I know I've mentioned this method before but fitting fish plates can be a little awkward and I know it's frustrating but if you get a bent piece of track of the same gauge that you're using and thread your fish plate onto a little, th you see where it's bent so it can't go any further and then just poke it on the rail and voila. I'm sure we've all been there cussing for hours on end about fitting fish plates especially insulated fish plates, but it's as easy as that. Right, get this board up on its side. Well, that's this point motor in place, but what I didn't really explain earlier, I think, was these four cables. These are the two 1602 cables that go to power the point, and these two 702 cables are the ones that bring power to the frog. So when this tortoise pointer uh, point motor makes one way or the other, it's the feed from either the red or the black cables that go to the frog. And that was the purpose of um, soldering all four to the point. 
I do hope that makes sense. These other three cables I rarely mention, which are the pink, the brown and the purple. These are feedback cables to tell train controller the position of the point and um, the yellow and the blue on the outside here are the cables that change the actually power the point. Well, time has gone on now and as you can see I've drilled the holes through in this board ready for the cables to go through to the major Dig Digitrax components which are now fitted on the other side. If we look down at the main board, main helix board, as you can see, I've fitted the Woodland Scenics foam track bed around the outside ready for the reverse loop. And the most stunning thing of all is the time. And that's time to call it a day. Well, it's now Tuesday morning and it's a quarter to nine. Today is a wiring day. Um, I'll be at it all morning. Sadly, this afternoon I've got to go for a hearing test. Pardon? Yes, a hearing test. And um, <laughs> get some new hearing aids, I imagine. Age is a wonderful thing. So with this board now, it's to wire up the DS64s. These are the things in the Digitrax world um, change your points there, stationary decoders. And I've also got a little bit of um, track work to do. Um, so we've got to pop this one in here. And this is the only piece of track on this board before all the boards join up. So I've got to do that one, wire these, um, put some wires into this thing here, this BDL, drop this board down, connect it up to board nine, and bring all those point wires across into here. And then we can look at doing that. So I'll be back in a couple of hours once this basic bit of wiring is done because it would just drive you bonkers anyway. Anyway, Oh, and if you haven't subscribed, now's a good time to hit that button. Well, I'm back from my hearing test and you'll be pleased to know that my wife was right. I can hear, I just choose not to listen. Now the wiring on this board is almost complete. As you can see, the four DS64 stationary decoders are all in, um, both the cables for switching the point and the feedback circuits. The BDL168 has got its first few cables. This is, a feed, this is the um, block occupancy module. Um, I haven't done anything with the uh, auto reverser yet, and there's the other DS64. This terminal block here, um, is just my feeds that go out to the to the points themselves. It's like your an ordinary DCC bus, except um, I buy these things on the on uh, Amazon, and there's a link in the show more tab. But it's worth mentioning these because they are absolutely brilliant. So there's your twelve terminals, and you get a shortened link in either red or black, or as you can see here, I cut it in half and use half for my black feeds and half for my red feeds. Um, and they are just brilliant. Comes with a little cover on the top, but it keeps your wiring so much easier. It's it's absolutely brilliant. Someone mentioned about the the tabs, uh, my labelling. Again, there's a link in the show more tab to a brother printer and a link to some cheaper um, tubing that you print on. Absolutely brilliant. Next thing is is this cable here. This is the LocoNet cable. Um, that, that transfers around the digital signal to tell everything what to do. Um, it's not only, it's a Digitrax thing, but it's not only used by Digitrax. I think it's a sort of a registered trademark kind of copyright thing. Anyway, as you can see, it links everything together. So the whole system knows exactly the position of all its components. And it's the DCC signal that's fed around on this system. Anyway, this is almost complete now. Um, I've got this one here to do when I bring the other board alongside. Um, and we're just about done. However, it is worth mentioning that this piece of track here and here were tighter than I'd hoped. Um, so uh, anyway, it's, it is what it is really. They're kind of between radius three and four, but they, I, I did want these to be a little bit um, less severe, let's say, but anyway, um, perhaps I didn't follow the track plan as closely as I'd hoped. And if we get a snag during the testing, then I'm going to have to reconfigure this and perhaps move this point that way and this point this way and then lessen the severity of that curve. But I'm not going to try and mend that now because actually we don't know if there's a problem. So let's call it a day and get to bed. 
Well, it's now Wednesday morning and it's 10 to 9. And after yesterday's horrendous uh, wiring challenge, let's say, um, it's, there's very little left to do on the wiring side. I just need to bring in um, a main feed into this buzz bar um, from the, the main control panel and that should power up all this, all this area. All should, all should be good to go. A little bit of testing then, just need to test the, make sure the points work and then we can bring in that last board and crack on with the reverse loop. So I'll crack on with this bit and then uh, we'll see you in a bit for that board. Well, it's all connected up somewhat temporarily in some cases. I don't have a power supply for these. I haven't done that uh, 12 volt DC ring main yet, but I have a little bit of a lash up with some power so I can check these out. Now the worrying bit is always when you turn the whole thing on and you may be able to see the blue panel behind me when I hit button C and hopefully it doesn't all go bang. Hasn't come on either. What have I missed? Oh. Power on. Nope, it's okay. All's well, I think. It just hasn't reset itself. Okay, so we've got power here. We've got 14.6 volts, drawing 0.3 of an amp, and if I put this on the track, hopefully we have power. Yes, we do, track power. Right, here I have a little class 25, 7638, loco, 7638, loco. Wrong way. And if you're any like, thing like me, when you wire electro frog points, you're always worried whether the frog is facing the right way which it appears that one is and then when we go into this one we'll go up to the far end and it should go right to the end yes it is yep okay I want to change point 71 switch 71 Okay. And then it should go straight through this one as well. Beautiful. Okay, confession time. When I change point 71, I heard a noise over there. I've got two points numbered 71 and two points numbered 72. <laughs> Clearly not as bright as I thought. Anyway, those two points over there need to be renumbered at some stage. The guts of this all seems to work. So what I need to do now is clear off that new board because it's become somewhat of a dumping ground, as it always will be, no doubt. Bring the board in and lay the track. Now, I acquired some DCC Concepts Legacy Code 100 track, which apparently has a higher nickel content than the Pico Code 100. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay that one out in that um, DCC Concepts track and then in the fullness of time we'll be able to see if it needs cleaning more or less often than the Pico stuff. I mean the Pico stuff has done me well for years so let's see if the DCC Concepts stuff is any better or worse as the pro progress of this layout goes on. Right, now the big board. Now a quick recap, these two points that you can see here both have an inward facing outlet, if that makes sense. The one at the bottom is a left-hander and the one at the top a right-hander. Well those two tracks go on to the main board to feed the up and down line of the helix. So we don't concern ourselves with those two points at this stage, but a little bit of background now on how and why the reverse loop needs a little bit of special attention. Now before we get stuck into the nitty gritty of it, I'd like to thank Greg of Fishplate Films. And please look up his channel. It's a very light hearted look at model railways, but he has some very interesting points to make, excuse the pun. 
And he's mentioned that on his reverse loop using a Digitrax AR1, which is an old relay type system rather than these um, upmarket solid state ones, when if you have the reverse loop coming off an, uh, an electro frog point, i.e. on the frog, it can cause problems. So taking his advice, I've put a piece of track in here, so my, rever my reverse link will start here, and the same on the other side with this piece of track, and it will end there. Okay, so that's the dimensions of the reverse link, reverse loop. It's also worth mentioning the initial bits about the problem. Now this fiddly yard area is wired up with red to the rear. So this being the rear end, that's the red rails coming around here. And of course, when the red goes right around, it comes back on the front track and not the rear track. This one is red on the outside, black on the inside, as the whole of the fiddle yard is. But it will arrive back there with the wrong polarity, as it were. So that's and you get a direct short. So that's why you must have some kind of um, reverse um, automatic reverser. So there we go. So all I need to do now is lay the track and it will look from here on, it'll all be metal fish plates. So there'll be one big loop and then I'll drop the droppers down and bring those back and wire them into this little um, Digitrax device. But it's worth mentioning the broader view of reverse loops. Now turning the camera down a bit, hopefully you can see this piece of rope. Now this piece of rope is the longest train that I own and your train must be shorter than the size of your reverse loop and that's fundamental because you don't want the train to come off and it reverses and then you've still got your other rest of your train is outside the reverse loop so if you're going to have a reverse loop you need to build the reverse loop longer than your train or of course run shorter trains but that's the guts of it so it's always worth having a piece of rope to represent your trains i think this one here might be an hst um, that's my goods trains, that's my short passenger trains, one of the little different markers. So that's how I do my calculations as it were. Right, so all I'm going to do now is get out some Pico track, Pico code 100 and run it around here, and then the um, DCC Concepts legacy track around the other side, so that in the long term of things we can see if one requires more cleaning than the other. Now something else that's always worth a mention is track cutting tools. Now these are Zuron, I think it starts with an X, doesn't it? Zuron track cutters. If you're using N-gauge, okay, you cut the track in a vertical manner. If you're using HO or double O, then you cut it in a horizontal manner and therefore you don't crush the form of the track. And it cuts very cleanly as long as they're in decent condition and then you just need a little bit of a file just to fettle them to make sure there's no sharp edges. It's far easier using these track cutters than it is using um, a Dremel, you know, with a, with a slitting disc. It makes it far easier and far quicker. Far safer too. Right, I need to get this track laid. Back in a bit. Right, the track is down and we're all sort of ready to go. Um, I will re-emphasize, here are two insulated fish plates and there are another two insulated fish plates. The rest of the fish plates around it are just metal, so it's just one big long block, as it were. I've got two cables running from here, a red and a black, into this, in the in and the out, and there's an in and out that runs to a small junction box down here, which then feeds to that isolated section. Okay, no idea if it'll work, so we'll turn track power on. And hopefully not making the same mistake as before. And I have got some green lights on this. And then over there is my trusty class 25, which is 7638. Oops. So 7638. And then hopefully it shouldn't stop or go fizz or bang when it hits that. Oh. And then it'll come around here and hopefully it should clear this at the same time. I can't believe I got away with this first time. How about that? Stop there. 
Right. Well, I must confess, in the Digitrax literature for this, it tells you to do some other things of shorting out plugs and testing this and testing that, none of which I have done. Um, there was another, um, I think it's Ron's, not Ron's Trains and Things, I'll get back with a link to that. Someone else did a review of this and he just sort of cuffed it and he, away he went. Let me just turn that off a second. Um, power off. Um, so I've got a short because I drove that train into a point. Right. Um, so this other chap, I can't, it's not Ron's Trains and Things, a very similar name anyway. I'll leave, there'll be a link coming up um, when he did a review of this. But this does seem absolutely brilliant. So what is that for me, for me here today? Well, I should be able to take a train from the station all the way around down the Helix all the way around the fiddle yard, all the way down round here, all the way back down the fiddle yard, up the helix and back into the station. Should we try that next? And just in case you think time's dragging here, it's now half past three. Now rather foolishly, I thought we might try my reverse livery Pullman and see how we get on. It's a very capable train. So it will leave here, go down the inside track of the helix, around the back of the fiddle yard, um, and then onto the reverse curve, and then back up the other way and should end up back in the station. The terrible thing about helix is couplings, because if couplings ride over each other, it, they tend to uncouple. Now this thing's got fixed couplings from Backman, so you shouldn't get that issue. My only real worry is over that area there where those curves are a little tight. So let's keep our fingers crossed and see how we get on. Oh, I'll let you know, I do have a kill switch which will shut all the, all the railway down. So we'll start this off and see how we get on. Oh, well, we've got a, a frog wired the wrong way around. OK, I'm afraid I cheated. I pulled it through by hand. Obviously, I've got a frog to... Um, to reconfigure. Now, this is the bit I was worried about because of the tightness of the curves. So now the whole train is on the reverse curve and zipping over to the other side. It should change polarity when it hits that insulated fish point. Oh, and we're through.
So running down the back curve now, I feel a little bit more confident. So I'll up the speed to 75. Here we go from one power district to another where you see the yellow marker. And on she comes to the helix once more. Looking rather splendid really. Now I must bring her to a halt. I must admit I found that rather scary. Obviously I've got this point down here where I had to drag the whole train um, through the point because every single coach on that Pullman has pickups. So it blocked up um, you know, the, all of this and both uh, power districts. So I had to pull that right through. Anyway, no big deal. So I need to sort that out. There's also, I think it's point number 67 over there on the new build. Um, won't fire so I'll have to do a bit of investigative work there um, but at the end of the day hey, it's only two wires and it can't be any that, that complicated and my embarrassing um, discovery that I've got two point motors with the same digital address just goes to show how, what, a, what a buffoon that we can all make of ourselves but there we go but again it's only sort of a half an hour job to disconnect it reprogram it reconnect it test it I'll just show you the Digitrax component here, what I've done with that. So here's the little thing from Digitrax. There are two label cables coming in from um, the terminal block and these two cables go out to the reverse loop. They actually don't go straight to the reverse loop because they come down onto this little terminal block here. So here are the two cables from that device and, and again, we've bridged them with those little um, bus, bus bar links and they just go out then to the cables within the reverse loop. So it's all straightforward stuff. I was actually surprised how easy it was to configure. Now I thought this time we would try a diesel goods train. So my little trusty 37 and see if we get any KD coupling breakaways. Well, clearly we have some success with our goods train. Now, throughout the video, we've been checking on the time and see how long these things take. Well, it's now quarter to six and my supper's ready at six. Not bad timing. Now, I can't deny it. After these three days, I am absolutely exhausted. But the layout has come a fair way with the wiring up of board nine into ten, the building of board 10 really with all the Digitrax bits and of course the helix base with its reverse loop and it all not all seems to work some of it doesn't work 
But these are minor sort of hiccups that we all find as railway modelers, don't we? Anyway, I need a good lay down. <laughs> and the sun's been blazing these three days and I think to myself, I should be out there on my little sun lounger. But there we go. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video, but let's talk about the next um, couple of videos because what I'm thinking you're doing is I could build the helix. I could put a reverse loop on the end of the upper board just to make trains run faster kind of thing. Um, or I could, uh, I could indeed do something a little bit different. Um, I have some work to do with Digitrax. I've got to upgrade the loco net. It was struggling at some stages, but these are little mountains that we have to climb, aren't they? So all I've got to remain to say is thank you very much for the patrons, for your help and support. Without you, I really couldn't do this. If you're not a subscriber, there's a button there and I would appreciate your support. In the meantime, there's a video here and here and I'll see you in two weeks time. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>